Okay. Okay. Welcome everyone to this month's uh, series. Uh, today, we are actually going to continue from last month, The Lord Sets Apart. And for those of you who had missed last month's session, uh, no worries, uh, we'll be making a bail the audio in January. Okay. Why the delay is because uh, basically we're trying to see how we can upload it at a website and make it available in YouTube so that uh, for those who miss the series over the course of this year, the different teachings, you'll still be able to go and uh, retrieve it and listen. So we encourage you when you get a chance in January when it's uploaded to go and listen uh, to what was the first series for this. So you'll be able to follow through, especially we spoke about 5782. So understanding 5782 will help you to even as you walk through 2022, when things are happening, you'll be able to make reference to what was already uh, spoken about and discussed and you will be prepared ahead. So I encourage you to go and listen when it's made of you. So moving on, when we talk about the Lord sets apart, firstly, we want to understand what is the definition about sets apart. So, you know, in our series, usually what we do is we always want to unpack the words. Uh, why we want to unpack the words? It's not an English lesson. However, in order for us to understand the depth of what the Spirit of God is speaking to us, many a times we need to pause and we need to take the effort to go and refer to understand what is the meaning of the word. So today, what we are going to do is we are going to uh, understand further when we say the Lord sets apart, what does it mean? So sets apart is basically as what we covered in the last month series is being allocated, consecrated, dedicated, devoted, reserved, saved, set by, gives up to, and earmarks. These are the basic definitions for set apart. So when we look at the Lord sets apart, there are two things that we mentioned last month. First is the seasons. The Lord sets apart seasons. And um, we can refer to Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3, when it says, uh, in his time, he makes things beautiful. So uh, sometime uh, in, in the course of the month, when I was just worshiping before the Lord, uh, when I was actually reflecting about the seasons and also about in his time, he makes all things beautiful. I, it, it's something that I've known the scripture before. And of course, uh, studying the seasons, I do understand what is the season all about. However, something that dawned on me was like, in his time, meaning to say the time is seasons. It is in his seasons, he makes things beautiful. Meaning to say, it is not in my season. You see, we have seasons that we walk through in life. So when we walk through in different phases of our lives, we always want to claim the scripture, including myself, Ecclesiastes chapter three, to say that, Lord, you promised that in your time, you'll make things beautiful, Lord. So when are you going to make things beautiful in my life? turn around my situation and the Holy Spirit just whispered to me to say that it is not in accordance to my calendar it is not according to my expected timing or it is not according to my scheduled season that the Lord does his things which are beautiful or turns around things it is in his season meaning to say he purposes when is the season which is set turn things beautiful around in our lives, in your lives, and in my lives. So that is about the season the Lord sets apart. So it is not according to our seasons, but his season. And uh, secondly, it's about individuals. We mentioned about individuals, meaning to say, um, we will say this month, we will look at individuals, and that is what we are going to look at. So just recapping a bit about the seasons for those who missed last month. This is just a very, very uh, fragmented portion. Uh, basically, when we look at seasons, we look at the Jewish calendar. We looked at the Jewish calendar and we understood that the Jewish calendar follows the solar and the lunar and it goes in cycles and it goes with the seven year period calendar and it's spiral. Ours, our calendar is actually a Gregorian calendar is a linear but the Jewish calendar is spiral and cycles. Now, you may have this question of Veronica, why are we looking at the Jewish calendar? I'm not a Jew. It's true that you and I are not Jews in this setting. However, our Jesus 
who was is a Jew. Okay, and the biblical times when you look at it, the setting, the scripture portions was all outlined and, 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 and indicated in reference to the Jewish calendar. It follows the Jewish calendar. So in order for us to fully understand the seasons of the Lord, studying the Jewish calendar is vital. Especially, it's also vital to understand the context of the scripture. Okay, that's when we get the full meaning of it. And in this calendaring of the Jewish calendar, they follow the moon and the sun. Okay, and the months correspond to the cycles of the moon and the years correspond to the cycles of the sun. However, they do not worship the sun and the moon. They only take reference to how it corresponds. Okay, so this is just a basic recap. So today we are looking at individuals. So when we say individuals, we might be wondering, um, so who are the characters today we are going to look at? Because usually we look at different characters, right? So we'll be wondering who are the characters, Veronica, we are going to look at, uh, is it which prophet is it? Or which uh, apostle is it? Okay, but basically today the individuals for our study is going to be you and me. Okay. The Lord sets apart, he has set apart many prophets and apostles and, and, and ordained ministers in the scripture by itself, we see. Even Mary, who sat at the feet of Jesus, she was set apart. Even Mother Mary, who was chosen to carry baby Jesus, was set apart. Okay, but in today's context, we are going to see how God sets you and me apart as individuals for him. So basically set apart. Basically set apart has two poles to it. One is by him, meaning to say we are being set apart by the Lord. Secondly, we are being set apart for him. Now it does not come to a completion when uh, we are just being set by him. It cannot be I'm set by the Lord and full stop. No, it is a comma. It is not a full stop. Because when we are being set apart by him, we are also being set apart for him. Now, where is the scripture evidence for this? We might be wondering. Psalms 4, 3, okay? It says a fundamental scripture for the Lord setting us apart for himself. It says the Lord has set apart for himself given distinction to him who is godly, the man of loving kindness. Meaning to say, the Lord gives distinction. Distinctively, he identifies you and me. The Lord is the one who does the choosing, the setting apart. And he just not chooses and leaves you there hanging, but he chooses, he sets you apart for something. And he also explains that you're being set apart for me. I set you apart for me. I'm not setting you apart to achieve uh, your aspirations, your ambitions, your dreams. All those are good. Okay? The Lord is not against our planning, our agendas, our aspirations. In fact, he wants us to aspire to be the best for the Lord. However, it should not come and collide with what the Lord has for us. Okay, because when he sets us apart, he does it for his purpose, for his plans, for his destiny for us. Basically, he sets us apart for himself. So to understand a bit more about set apart in the Hebrew context, it means Kodesh. Okay, now what does this Kodesh mean? Now, before we look into what does Kodesh mean, we want us to understand that the root word for Kodesh comes from this word Kadesh. Okay, okay, so Kodesh is the main word, but the root word is Kadesh. And now what does this mean? Now, Kodesh means, uh, sometimes we even mention it as Kadosh, okay? So, um, but there's also this spelling known as Q also, Kadosh, there's also this meaning that says the same as uh, this Kodesh is most commonly translated as holy, okay? That is the definition, the understanding of that uh, basic word of what set apart means, being set, being holy. Now, if you look at the root word, Kadesh, it means to set apart for a specific purpose, consecrated, appointed. So the top word is, the, the, the main word, Kadesh, is being holy, translated to being holy, and the root word is being set apart. 
Okay, so if I put both the words together to have a better understanding, this is what we will define it as to set apart, consecrated, and appointed to be holy. So when the Lord says, I set you apart according to Psalms 40, okay, it's not a fanciful title that we have the Lord set apart for himself and by him. No, Psalms 43 says the Lord himself sets apart us, we who are godly, for himself. And meaning to say he sets us apart, he consecrates and he appoints us to be holy. Now we are going to study to find out why is he setting us apart, what is the consecration, and why we need to be appointed to be holy. Now, before I go on, I'm going to give you all a time to talk, to just share with me what do you understand now? Why do you think, before we explore further, why do you think we need to be set apart at all? How can we be set apart? How can we be appointed to be holy? Anybody? There's no right or wrong answer. You can unmute yourself and you can just uh, say your views. Anyone? He has set us apart from sin. Yes, set us apart from sin. And what sin to be holy. Okay. To be holy, good. And, uh, yeah. and and how does he do it? Any idea? I mean, any understanding of how? Any guess? Through Jesus Christ. To Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we will just continue. Thank you, uh, sister, for sharing. Okay. Um, so basically, as what uh, the sister shared, you know, um, we are cleansed from our sins, you know, through Jesus Christ. Uh, basically, what happens is there are four steps that happens when we are being set apart. Now, I just want to make a false statement here that this topic about being separated, sanctified, consecrated, and dedicated is a whole study by itself. And this, we will be doing it another platform, okay? Another time we will study in depth, okay? However, for today's study, we are just going to go to the surface level to understand about set apart because today our understanding is about set apart. So we do not want to get derailed. I do not want to uh, take up too much of time explaining because it's a whole subject by itself. So basically when we say we are being set apart by the Lord, what happens firstly is we are being separated. Meaning to say, just like the scripture says that, you know, he distinctively, he gives a distinction, right? When he, he sets people apart from himself. Similarly, separated means making a distinction between. To give you a better understanding is uh, that it's a basket of fruits, okay? Now, I particularly want to have a green apple, okay? I just want to have a green apple. So what happens is in the basket of fruits, I will only choose the green apple, Okay. Meaning to say, I choose one out of the many fruits. I make a distinction, identify it, and I separate it from amongst the other fruits. A separation takes place. Okay, That is one example. Another example, if there is some kind of fungus on my skin, okay, what happens is sometimes surgically, the doctor has to operate. Meaning to say he needs to separate the fungus, the bacteria from my skin so that the rest of my hand can be saved from the fungus, okay, from the bacteria. So sometimes separation takes place surgically, which is painful. The healing can be slow, but surely you are being separated from that virus. Okay? That is separation. Secondly, sanctified. Now, when we talk about sanctified, it's to purify, to be purified. After being separated, what happens is you go to this process of being purified. As what the sister said, we are being cleansed by the blood of the lamb. We are set apart. We are being purified. We go through that process. And then what happens is we devote ourselves, we consecrate ourselves to the Lord. We say, Lord, we accept you. You are mine. You know, I'm yours. You are my Lord. We devote our heart towards him. And finally, we commit our lives to him. Okay. So this four processes take place simply because we are being set apart by him and for him. So every time we understand that the Lord sets us apart for himself, 
in accordance to four, Psalms 4.3, what happens is there is a separation process which takes place. There's a sanctification process that takes place. There's a consecration process that takes place. There's a dedication process that takes place. Now, can we say that this is a one-time thing that happens? In my understanding, it's no. This separation, sanctification, uh, consecration, dedication, for the first time when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, yes, it happens that first time. That's definite, okay? The work at the cross is being complete, definitely. But where I'm coming is in our different dimensions of our life, in the different compartments of our life, there needs to be a separation and sanctification and consecration and dedication that takes place ongoing. So this is an ongoing process. Sometimes it's in our family life, sometimes it's in our personal life, sometimes it's with our relationships, sometimes it's in our job area, sometimes it's with our walk with the Lord, sometimes it's on financial aspect, it's different aspect. But the Lord constantly works to separate, sanctify, consecrate, and ensure that we dedicate that portion that we are holding unto him because he sets us, he identifies and sets us apart for himself. So this is something that we want to understand when we talk about set apart. And if you look at Luke 22, chapter 22, verse 42, the scripture says, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but always your speaker. This is an amplified version, huh? always, okay? You can see in the brackets. So we want to unpack the scripture for us to better understand. Now, Jesus knows the mind of God. He knows the mind of his father. He knows exactly why he was sent to the world. He knows exactly what it is to come. He knows exactly what is the end of the story because he is the writer of the story, right? So he perfectly knows the, the phases, the different uh, uh, points that things will happen, and he knows the conclusion to the story. We do not know the conclusion, the end of our story, because we are not the author of our lives. But he, being the author who was uh, orchestrating the entire creation of the world, he definitely knows the end of the story. Regardless of that, at this point, we see Jesus calling out to the Father to say, if you are willing, meaning to say, if is subjective, it can happen, it cannot happen. And he's putting head before the Lord to say, if you are willing, Jesus does not enforce his personal choice or his personal will. Okay, He puts it before the Father to say, if it's very subjective. You're willing to remove this cup. And then he makes a declaration by saying, not my will. And he makes a surrender to say, yours be done. Now, we may ask ourselves, Jesus being so close and he is one with the Father, the scripture says. And so why did he make this term of if? Okay. Simply because not that he was afraid of the pain that he will go through, but he knew the weight of the sin and the curse and the contamination he is going to carry. And at that moment, he knows one thing for sure, that he will be separated from his dearly beloved father. That was the biggest pain Jesus had. Because you know, in the scriptures it says that when Jesus was being crucified, at that moment when things was climaxing, you will see what happens between the father and him. So it was that separation, it was that moment of the silence of his father that weighed him a lot, that he had to make this prayer, if you're willing. It was very subjective. And yet again, he declares and he surrenders. And you will see basically the four steps that we saw earlier, Jesus going through it. He was separated from his father. He was chosen to come to this world to carry the cross for us. Okay, and not only that, he died, he resurrected. So there was a separation that took place there. And then you will see con constantly he's being purified. When we say purification, he was also tempted, the scripture says. In the Gospels, it says that he went to the mountains and he was tempted and he overcame them. He went to that purification there. And then he consecrated his entire time here uh, until the Lord's work, until his father's work. He dedicated his life 
Even in the, in the Lord's life, in Jesus' life, we will see these things happen. Okay, and then we want to move on. Today, this is whatever I say is setting the context for the Lord said so far. Okay, so the two key references we, we drew, you saw from Luke and from Psalms to say that what happens about the Lord setting apart the processes that are being involved. So that are those, those are the fundamentals. Now, moving on to understand uh, the Lord sets apart, we are going to look from two dimensions today. Okay, one is the porter and one is the refiner. Now, the Lord can choose any ways that he wants to set us apart. But from the scripture for today's study, we are, we are taking reference about the porter and the refiner, who is the Lord himself, and what he does as a porter and what he does as a refiner to set you and me apart. So this is a picture of a porter, which you can see very clearly. And today's scripture reference for the porter is definitely, I think you all are aware, it's Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 to 6. Okay, uh, Tara, would you be able to read this for me? I may have to minimize. Yeah, sure. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, arise and go to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he was working at the wheel. And the vessel that he was making from clay was spoiled in the hands of the potter. So he made it over, reworking it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does, says the Lord, behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Thank you, Tara. Okay, this is a scripture portion we are going to look at today for the potter in terms of the Lord sets apart. And before that, I think uh, just like how the Lord directed Jeremiah to say, go down to the potter's house and see what the potter is doing. Today, we are going to have some bit of a virtual, a virtual experience. We are going to see a very short video about what happens at the pottery. Okay, how does a porter make a pot from a clay? Okay, so. Hello, I'm John the Potter from Eastern Pottery and the Flying Potter and I'm going to show you five easy steps to making a pot on the potter's wheel. But before I do that, the big thing, if, if you like, the golden rule of making pots on the potter's wheel is that you must always, at all times, keep your arms rooted on the drip tray or on your, on your legs there. Hands rooted and working together. So at any point in whatever I'm doing um, on, the, on the clay, my hands will be working together. Okay. Step number one, centering. Okay, I've tried to get that clay as near to the middle as I possibly can, but you can see as it's going around, it's still slightly off centre. We need to correct that, and step number one is the centering. And to do that, your arms are going to be rooted, hands working to be together, and you're going to be pushing the clay away from you. And as you push, the only place that the clay can go is upwards. So I'm pushing away, slightly down and away, and just pushing the clay up. and then you karate chop it back down. And you'll know when it's centered because there won't be any play, there won't be any wobble there. You can't compromise, the clay has to be completely centered. If there's any wobble, it doesn't matter how tiny it is, that, that little wobble will just get amplified later on. That's step number one. And you'll know it's centered because there won't be any, any, um, any shaking in your hands. Step number two, is the hole. Very simple, both arms rooted, anchored on the drip tray, one finger, and all I'm doing there is I'm just pressing down into the clay to make the hole. Obviously remembering not to go right to the, uh, the metal, otherwise you end up with a pot with a hole in the bottom. Step number three, you're just going to pull the clay out. 
and don't put it out too far. People do get a bit kind of carried away with this because they're pulling the clay and it's all centered and it's all opening up very nicely. Um, and they kind of like enjoy that feeling and they pull and they pull and suddenly the clay's out here with no clay left then to lift up into the, into the pot. So as a, as a rule, just pull your finger out um, for a piece of clay this size, probably a, an inch, inch or so. Step number four, you're actually going to start to lift this collar of clay into the walls of the pot. And uh, I'm going to show you, I, I work, um, sometimes work with people who have only got two or three minutes to uh, give them the experience of throwing a pot on the potter's wheel. So I'm going to show you the one-handed technique where you grab a hold of your wrist, your thumbs on the inside, finger on the outside, and you very, very gently squeeze in from the outside. So your inside thumb is passive and all the pressure is in that outside finger. So I'm just very, very gently pinching in and you can see that clay beginning to lift. Now if I maintain that same amount of pinch and begin to lift my fingers up, the fingers will cut through and they'll touch each other and this collar of clay will come flying off the wheel. So what you need to do is twofold. As you squeeze in and you begin to lift, you have to release the pressure as you go and it's a gradual, gradual, gradual release from the bottom to the top. So when you get to that point there, there's hardly any pressure there at all. And you just repeat that a couple of times. I'm squeezing at the bottom between my fingertips. And as I'm lifting, I'm releasing the pressure as I go. And ideally, you want a cylinder shape. If you can throw a cylinder shape, you can almost throw any shape you like on the potter's wheel. The cylinder is a mother shape of all shapes. So this is something called collaring, where I'm actually squeezing the clay in just to try and get that, uh, that cylinder shape. Step number five, you've got the cylinder. Step number five is just all about shaping. So I've got the wheel going around even slower than I had it a few seconds ago. One hand inside, one hand on the outside. You can see my hands are still working together as one. Well. I'm just going to very, very gently shake the clay, very gently squeezing out from the inside. Just to give the pot some nice shape. It's very important that you take all the water out. If you leave the, uh, the water inside the pot, it just migrates into the clay wall and you turn your back and the whole thing's kind of collapsed. So it's very important that you get that, that water out from inside. Just going to clean it up a little bit at the bottom. steps to making a pot on the potter's wheel. So you take the pot off and put it down very, very gently. The number of times I've seen people kind of want to finish on a flourish and they sort of take this, this pot off the wheel and they pop it down onto the board and they drop it from only has to be a couple of centimetres from uh, above the board. It's enough just to flatten the clay. So when you take your pot off, put it down very, very gently. Thank you. Okay, I think you all had a good uh, view about what is uh, a potter's wheel. Now, why we actually brought you to see this as uh, simple as uh, mentioned earlier, uh, you see, when Jeremiah was living in those times, I'm sure he could have walked past a potter's house. You know, those times, uh, it was very different compared to here. We have to go to a particular venue to see how pottery can be made. But in those days, it could have been a common occupation you know, like uh, Jesus' time when uh, his father was a carpenter. It, it, was, a, it was not, um, how do I say, it, it was a, a common trade. So similarly, uh, a potter was something that was very common then. However, the Lord specifically wanted Jeremiah to go there to see with his eyes and while he's seeing, the Lord instructs him. So similarly for us, for us to understand the context of Jeremiah chapter 18, seeing uh, uh, a potter at work and what are the steps he does and how he goes about it helps us to give certain context of uh, understanding of what happens in order for us to know when we say the Lord sets, up, sets us apart, uh, like how a potter will work on a, on a clay, we will have a better understanding. Okay, that is the idea of why we actually brought you to see the video. So now, 
coming to the, the main bulk of that verse is all that highlighted words are what we are going to make reference to to study in a little depth. Okay, and it says here the porter was working at the wheel and the vessel that he was making from the clay was spoiled in the hand of the porter. So, okay, the key word here is so, we need to say therefore. Okay, he made it over. It was spoiled, so he made it over. Okay, the same pot, he made it over the same clay, reworking it into another vessel as it seemed good to the porter. Not good for you or for me or for a passer buyer or person who wants to purchase the vessel, but to the porter's eyes. Okay. Now, we are going to look at the characteristics of the porter in order for us to understand how the Lord sets us apart. Now, the Lord sets us apart. Uh, we are looking to uh, from two different dimensions. One as a potter, as how a potter works with a clay, how the Lord sets us apart, meaning to say the Lord is the potter, and then what happens is we are the clay. So how that process works through. That is the first segment we are looking at. Okay, so here, if you look at the verse, as all those highlighted was earlier on, behold, he was working at the wheel, and you will see the diligence. When we looked at the video, we actually saw uh, the porter always having his uh, hands rested. Okay, if, if you look at it, he always had to, he always had to uh, be positioned in, in a manner that he, he has to be working. He, he mentioned that his fingers, his hands were always working together. There was no one time he put down his right hand or left hand and just worked with one hand. He had to always be working with both hands. And you see the diligence there that he never moves his hands away. He never moves his attention away. He never moves his eyes away from the, the clay that he's making. His attention is fully there. He's very diligent. Is very observant of what is happening. And if you look at the biblical references, Psalms 121, 121 verse 4, it says that, Behold, the Lord who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Now, the Lord diligently watches over us. When we say he, keep, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep, you see the attribute of the Lord. He is diligent. So when the Lord is actually setting us apart when he's working on us, like how a potter will work on a clay, when he's working on us to set us apart, he is diligently watching over us. He's diligently at work in our lives to set us apart. There's no one time he takes a break. You and I take breaks, but the Lord has no break. He is diligently is always observing what is happening to our lives, how we are overcoming things, what are our challenges, how will we move through it. He is observant and is well aware of everything. Okay, that is the first attribute of the porter. Secondly, and the vessel that he was making from clay was spoiled in the hand of the porter. It was spoiled. Okay, but the porter did not give up. He perseveres. Now, why does he persevere despite the clay being spoiled in his hand? Zephaniah 13, 317, Zephaniah 317. Okay, it says that the Lord rejoice over us. He rejoice over you with joy. And there's a further explanation which says that he makes no mention of our past sins or he, he doesn't even recall them. Basically, he's more focused on rejoicing over us, not bringing into remembrance of what are the wrong deeds we did. Meaning to say, he never gives up on us. We can be spoiled in his hands. We would have made blunders in our lives. We would have gone wrong in so many aspects. But the Lord, when he is pressing on to ensure that we become the vessel that he sets us apart, he pursues, he perseveres, he doesn't give up. He doesn't give up based on our past records. Okay, When the clay gets spoiled, it is not something pleasant. It can frustrate the potter. After all the hard work I've put in, what happened to you? But 
the porter does not take offense with the clay, but rather he decides to create a new vessel out of it. So here we see the attribute of the Lord persevering. He does not give up and instead he makes no recollection of our past blunders, but he instead wants to rejoice over you and me, even as we go through the process of being set apart by him. Thirdly, the play gets spoiled. So what he does, he decides to make it over. He does not decide to throw it away. He does not decide to say this clay is hopeless. I think I'll get something else to work on. No. He does not get up and say, I will go for a break. I'll come back. I'll clear my mind a bit. I will watch some TV. I'll go for a run. I will eat something, some ice cream to cool my mind. And then maybe I'll come back to work so that, you know, uh, maybe it will get better this time. I'll get better at working on it. No. Scripture says when Jeremiah was watching the potter, the clay was spoiled in the potter's end. And immediately, it was an immediate reaction of the potter. He made something out of it again. He remade it. He did not take a pause. He did not stop working. Because the Lord is patient with us. As a clay, many times we can go in our own ways. Now, a clay will not be able to jump around because it doesn't have, um, literally, it doesn't have hands and fingers. But we human beings who are the clay, we do have our hands and fingers. So many a times we jump out of the potter's wheel and we walk our way to say, I want to take a stroll. I'm tired of being, uh, being squashed and pressed and pinched and pressed and pulled and lifted at the potter's wheel. Let me get a break. Let me walk out, get a stroll, and I come back. That's what the clay we will do. But he, the potter, he patiently looks at the clay which has been spoiled and he says, now I'm going to remake something again. Because Psalms 103 verse 8 says, the Lord is merciful and gracious. He is slow to anger. We could have made blunders, we would have gone wrong in whatever that we could have perceived it to be, but he does not take offense with us, simply because we are clay. How can a potter take offense with the clay? Now, for a moment, just visually imagine what you saw earlier. The guy is working with, the, the potter is working with the clay and the clay gets marred, gets spoiled in his hand. Now, can he get angry with the clay and scold the clay? Can he say that, why are you doing this? I invested so much of my time and energy and efforts instead of going out you know, for a movie. I set you to work on you and yet you get spoiled. Now I have to redo it again. Can he get angry with the clay? He can't. He will not. Why? Because he knows that it is just a piece of clay. So simply, there are many a times when we go wrong, the Lord is slow to anger simply because not only his plenteous in mercy and loving kindness, he simply is aware that we are mere clay. We are just dust of the ground. Okay. And that is one reason why he is unconditionally patient with us. <clears throat> Secondly, he is very determined because he decides to rework it into another vessel. The very clay, spoiled, so he wants to remake it into another vessel. He doesn't give up, he's determined, he, pers he perseveres, he has all determination to make it right. And Proverbs 16 verse nine says that the Lord directs, in this portion it says the Lord directs. But other translation, if you look at it, it will say the Lord determines the steps steps, your steps and my steps. We can make plans, but the end result is determined by the Lord. And here the potter reworking the clay which was spoiled in his hand into another vessel shows the determination of the potter. He doesn't call it quits. Many a times in our lives when our plans do not go the way that we have perceived or desire or aspired it to be, we give up, we get frustrated. We will say that this is not working. Where am I? Why is this happening? We get frustrated. It's understandable. 
because we are mere humans. But the Lord does not get frustrated with us. He determines, when he determines to set us apart for himself, he ensures he determines our ways. We can make plans, but why only he determines? It's because he doesn't want us to walk out of what he has determined for us. We have some plans which are good, but the Lord's plans are better, the scripture says. So he does not want us to end up with the secondary best. He wants us to end up with the best. So what happens? He channels your path. He determines, he directs your path. If he's going this way, turn this way. Sometimes we don't understand why. Sometimes we question, I thought everything was going right. Why suddenly this, this turn? Why this U-turn? What is happening? Because the Lord determines the steps. Because he is relentlessly working to make it into another vessel. He is working in us so that we can be a vessel that is acceptable unto him. So he's determined in that aspect. And he's very precise. Okay, the potter is very precise. You can see the work that the potter does. He really looks at every details, even sends off at the end, you know, make sure there's no water in it. You can see that he's very precise in the way he does so that the clay turns into a beautiful pot. So, and here you will see the verse says that as it seemed good to the potter to make it. It is not about how we feel, how we think it should look like. It is not about what we perceive it to be or what we desire it to be, our life to be. It is according to what he seems it good to be. Okay, so remember earlier on, I mentioned about seasons and I said about in his time and he said if things happen, he makes things beautiful in this season, not in my season. Okay, it is not in my uh, prescribed season. So similarly, the Lord makes things good uh, in our lives or, or makes our lives good as to what he sees it, not according to what I see it, not according to what you see. To me, this might be good, but to the Lord, this might not be good. So what happens? He erases it away and he recreates. And when he erases some things of our lives, we cry, we break down, say, Lord, why? I put in so much of effort. And why, Lord? Because it did not seem good to him, the potter. And is he making a mistake? No, because he's so precise. He's very definite of how he works. Why? The biblical reference is Deuteronomy 32 verse 4 says, his work is perfect. In other words, your work and my work may not be perfect. Or definitely they are not the perfect piece of work. We are imperfect beings and our works are imperfect. Our plans are imperfect. Our thoughts are imperfect sometimes. But his is perfect. So when he decides it is good, it is perfect. When he decides this is not good for us, that means it is still his work is perfect. Whether it's good or not good, he decides and what he decides is perfect for us. That is what a potter does to a clay and what the Lord does to us when he sets us apart. So here you can see the full overview about what we shared so far, the five characteristics of that particular scripture portion, the diligence, the perseverance, the patience, the determination, and the precision. Okay, so now moving on to Jeremiah 18, we are still in Jeremiah, but now we move to verses 5 to 6. Okay, this is still under the context of the portal. Then the word of the Lord came to me. This is Jeremiah, O house of Israel. Now you can see this verses all highlighted, which you're going to look little by little. Uh, can I not do with you as this potter does? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. Now, the first part, can I not do with you as this potter does? Now, in this question, what I identified and studied is, there's such an authority of the Lord. He is not asking us for permission. He's not asking you permission to work in your life. He's not asking for my permission to do things in my life. He's asking, can I not do with you as this porter does? Now you see the porter, basically what he was saying is, now you see the porter, the porter, he was trying to work something out of the clay and what happens, it got spoiled. And then the porter constantly, continuously, he works to create another vessel out of it. It's not giving up, right? So similarly, can I not do this with you? 
you could have been spoiled in my hands. You could have made mistakes. You could have gone wrong thinking you are right. But can't I still rework something in you? Do you think that I can't? That is the tone of authority there. Because the Lord is able, because Genesis 1, 3 says, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. It is just the spoken word of God, the light was formed. God didn't have to do magic there. God didn't have to show signs, this, that, or something like that, you know. When we want to do drama, we want to, you know, bring out this character of God, you know, let there be light, we do, let there be light, you know, we do actions and all of it. Okay, when I was growing up in my church, uh, some assembly, you know, we used to do a lot of uh, drama. Those were the best days I always used to say, uh, practically involved in everything in the church, right up to washing of the toilet, right up to accounts, right up to administration, worship, you name it, everything was covered. So I always say those years when I was growing up uh, in, in uh, my, my maternal church, I always call it, you know, seminar assembly. I think uh, the Lord pruned me in every aspect. It, it started there. OK, so in that drama, we used to have real drama. OK, we really do it. But here, God didn't have to do those dramatization. God just had to speak. And in that word, there was authority. So if God can say, let that be light, and there was light, do you think God can rework your life and my life, even when things are not pleasant? Do not you think he has the authority to rework and create something beautiful and new in your life? Of course he can, because he is the master potter. He's not just any clay potter, but he's the master potter who is working on us, the clay, to set us apart for himself. And there's ownership. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. So here we see the Lord with such an authority. He's saying that, please understand that you are in my hand. Now, in Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed men. Okay. But from where did God form men? It is from the dust of the ground. So when you make reference to clay, it's basically, it's all in the same category, the same, the, the same uh, genre, the same family. We are just mere clear. We are just mere dust. But because the Lord breathed, in, breathed, he breathed into us his breath, we became alive. So, of course, he has the ownership upon our lives. Now, I'm seated here. I'm talking to you. I'm known as Veronica, right? And while I'm speaking, I go to be with the Lord. Maybe the next one hour, after I'm finished speaking, I get to bed, and then I say, Tata, I'm going home. I've gone to be with the Lord. You know, so hallelujah, praise the Lord, I'm gone up. However, when um, they have brought me to the mortuary and then they bring me back uh, to the parlor, uh, friends and you know loved ones who come to visit uh, me for the final time to say Tata is they many a times people will say uh, where is the body when is the body coming they don't ask when is Veronica coming if they ask when is Veronica coming it might sound a bit eerie for some because hey, she's dead and then you say she's coming you don't say the wrong things like then you're calling the spirit back you know I've heard this not in Christian um, funerals, non-Christian funerals, I've heard these people say. Uh, basically, what I'm trying to say is, when I die, I still have my hands, I still have my fingers, I still have my nails, I still have my legs, my feet, I still have my, my hair, my head, my eyes, my face, my ears, my nose, my mouth, my neck, my entire being, from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet, everything is the same. But why? They don't call me as Veronica. They call me as a body. Only for one reason. You look everything externally, I look the same. Perfect. The same person. The structure is the same. But inside, there's no more value. There's no spirit. So the moment the Lord breathes into us, we become a person with respect. We, we have value. We are called with our name. But the same Lord, when he calls us back home, he removes the spirit. He removes his breath from us. 
we become again the dust, we become the body. So why I give this analogy is simply to, for you and me to understand that no matter how high and far we fly in life, or how backward we can be in life, or how stagnated we can be in life, whichever dimensions we are in life, we need to understand one thing, that we are just mere clay in the hands of the master potter. Meaning to say, he decides what is best for us. He decides what is needed for the clay. He decides what vessel the clay needs to be formed into. So he has the authority upon our lives and he has the ownership. So as a porter, you can see that he has the authority and ownership. And so what happens is, this is the process through which he sets us apart. So every time we want to understand the Lord sets us apart, we want to understand that he is diligent to orchestrate things in our life according to his plans, not according to my plans, not according to your plans. Sometimes we don't like the Lord's plans. Let's admit it. Simply because we don't understand it, right? We love the Lord. We definitely want to do right by him. But sometimes we don't like the plan simply because when he is working on it, the plans in our life, we are clueless of what is happening. Okay, I give you the ex example of uh, this COVID situation. Uh, today, our minister, our uh, prime minister, actually gave a, um, a live uh, uh, tele. I mean, uh, he, he spoke to the entire nation about. Um, the measures that we are going to put in place and what's going to happen and what we need to do and all of it. And uh, simply when, you know, I mean, um, when we hear all this, you know, we, we know whenever we know that our PM is going to speak, everybody gets alert and we, we think of, okay, what is he going to say? And we sit and eagerly we listen to it. And as much as we listen, we have no answer to it. In our situations, we, we will say that there's no answer. Even, even he can't exactly say, when will COVID leave Singapore? Or when will we get fully resilient to COVID? Or when would we come into the normal life as how it was before 2020? He can't give us a definite answer. No one can give us a definite answer. So sometimes we always wonder what in the world is happening for us. But one thing I'm assured is God knows exactly what he's doing. If things are happening, haywire, things are not going right, whatever it is, one thing I always uh, testify to, to colleagues and um, uh, even to, to friends or whoever that I come across is the Lord is still seated in the throne, regardless of what is happening, even in our lives, things may not be as how we, we desire it to be, but he's diligently orchestrating things in accordance to his will, simply because he's still seated in the throne. He has not taken a break and he will pursue here. He will not give up. He will pursue to align things in our life. Remember the scripture that says he determines and he directs our steps. When things are going, is getting misaligned, he will align it back again. And he's patient to pursue after our lives. Many a times in uh, the Christian walk, it is the Lord who pursues after us. But in the worldly realm, many a times we pursue after our relationship, our friends, our connections. We pursue after them. We make time, we make effort to build the relationship. But in the Christian world, how many times do we pursue after the Lord? Or is it the Lord who is patiently pursuing after us? And why is he patiently pursuing after us? So that he can fulfill what he has set us apart for. And he determines what needs to be done, what needs to be, uh, be functioning in our life, what needs to be orchestrated. He is the one who determines the steps, the plans, the orchestrating of the entire uh, drama of our life, the sequence of our life, the plans of our life. He knows the end of the story. So he determines what happens and he ensures it's precise. Now, in our eyes, we may say that my life is not perfect. It is true. We are still work in progress. So the question is, when will our life be perfect? When will he stop working on us as a clay? The answer that I have for myself, I would say is when I see him face to face, either he brings me home 
or either he I uh, either he comes or either he brings me home. That is when this falter and clay work stops. Till then, he is going to be breaking me, molding me again and again and again, simply because he's not done with me. Similarly, he's not done with you. So this potter's work at the potter's wheel, it's a never ending job. So similarly, we as a clay being set apart by him, it ends only when we see him face to face in his glory. Till then, we are going to be in the potter's wheel. We are going to be squashed. We are going to be flattened. We are going to be lifted. We are going to be pinched. We are going to be squeezed. All this is going to happen. Okay, so that is the first part of the study for today. Mindful of the time. So next, we are going to go to the refiner. Okay, uh, Tara, can I ask you to read this again? Thank you. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the priests, the sons of Levi, and refine them like gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Thank you, Tara. So similarly, just like how we saw about the potter, I want us to just see, uh, this is a very short video about what happens basically uh, when we say that a silver is being refined, okay? This is the shortest video and the most simple one. Uh, if you all have time, you can go and um, look at YouTube. Some videos are like 30 minutes, 25 minutes. So you can go and study the entire process of how it works. But here for our study, just want to show you this. Part. The action begins down in the mine, where geologists point a niton gun at various spots in the rock face. The device detects the levels of 40 different elements, including silver. Silver in its natural state isn't silver colored at all, it's charcoal gray. Miners drill holes in the silver-rich areas the geologists pinpointed, then insert sticks of dynamite. Parts haul the chunks of rock, called ore, to the surface. Geologists then test ore piles and blend them as required. The ore first goes into the primary crusher. The machine's huge steel teeth break up the big chunks into smaller pieces. Those pieces then drop through grates below into the secondary crusher, which breaks them down into even smaller pieces. Those go into vibrating cone crushers, which pulverize them into tiny pieces. A conveyor transports the crushed ore to the ball mill. As the mill's large cylinder rotates, steel balls bounce around inside, grinding the ore into powder. A water circulation system flushes the silver-rich powder out of the cylinder and into large tanks, which keep the water moving. To separate and dissolve the metals the powder contains, workers pour in acid. The solution containing dissolved silver is pumped through filter presses. The filter plates are treated with a zinc-based chemical which attracts silver molecules. As the solution passes through, the plates trap particles containing silver, forming a layer of black powder called silver precipitate. This precipitate is composed of approximately 50% silver and 50% waste. To separate the silver from the waste, they first dry the precipitate in a gas furnace for a couple of hours. Workers put the now-dried silver precipitate into an oven, along with chemicals which prevent silver from burning off. Approximately four hours later, the silver and waste have separated and melted. Workers pour them into bar-shaped molds. The silver, being heavier, settles at the bottom. Workers skim off the waste floating on top. In less than five minutes, the molten silver cools and hardens, enabling workers to extract what is now a silver bar. The mining company sells the bars to a refinery. Now the process of refining fine metal starts when gold, silver, platinum, and palladium are delivered to the refinery in several impure forms. The lots of precious metals are weighed and tabulated, then the lots are combined with flux, which looks a lot like you're actually making matters worse by pouring a bunch of dirty sand in with the metal, but it's actually a very important ingredient. This flux and the impure metal is placed in a vessel called a crucible. 
this is made from material that can take the heat better than the material inside it. So the crucible is then put into a melting furnace that transforms the metal and flux into a molten material. The crucible is then removed and the molten material is poured into a mold, sometimes shaped like a brick or other times like an inverted cone. Especially when they use a lot of flux in a cone-shaped mold, the flux fuses with the undesired matter to form a slag that is lighter than the precious metals. The slag naturally floats to the top of the mold, leaving a pure button of metal below. You can then easily separate the metal button from the slag. Once the whole lot has been melted and sampled, it's then remelted and recooled into grains about the size of BBs in order to speed up the extraction process. The grains are then placed into a mantle where an acid solution is used to dissolve the metals into a liquid form. Once the metals are fully dissolved, chemists use other substances to induce reactions that extract the exact metal they are looking for. The results are that you end up with an absolutely pure piece of gold, silver, platinum, or palladium. Okay, so now we are back. So now you got a bit of an understanding of how silver is derived. Basically, silver is not silver at the start of it. And uh, through the process, you see they actually add dirt with it. And uh, it goes through refining again and again. And purification takes place for the end result. So similarly, when we look at the refiner in Malachi chapter 3, verse 2, to three. Uh, all those highlighted words are what we are going to look at about he's like a refiner's fire and he will sit as a refiner and purifier. So if we look at it, firstly, we see that when he is like a refiner's fire, he's basically the refiner himself. Now, who is the he? He's the Lord God himself, Lord Jesus himself. Okay, he becomes the refiner of our lives. Because Isaiah 48 verse 10 says, Behold, I have refined you. Okay, so the, when we go through fiery furnace in our life, when we go through situations which are not pleasing, we go through uh, times which are dry, the seasons are dry, and everything seems bare, and it, it's like a desert experience we are going through, and we're wondering, Lord, where are you? What is happening? I loved you. I served you. I called upon you, and I've always been clinging on to you from, from the youngest age or the seasons that have been uh, so much younger when I was so much younger Lord in those seasons I've been holding on to you and what happened we may have a lot of questions but we want us to understand that even in that moment the Lord is refining you even when everything looks bare and empty and desolate we don't seem to make meaning to it he being the refiner when he sets us apart even in that situation which looks hopeless the Lord is refining that is the first attribute we want to understand. Secondly, he's a purifier. Okay, uh, we saw in the video that um, the silver is being purified, is being separated from uh, the debris and the dirt. It's being purified so that the end result can be a, a real silver by itself, a quality silver. So he sits as a refiner and purifier of silver. And Psalm 66 verse 10 says, you have tried us as silver is tried, refined, and purified. So when we are going through the refining process, purification takes place. Remember at the start of it, we saw this diagram which spoke about consecration. And then we also saw about sanctification and we saw about separation, we saw about dedication. Now, if you see there's this part called sanctification, right? After being separated, in that sanctification, the definition is to purify. This is what happens. The purifier, he actually starts purifying us in that particular uh, dimension. The dimension of being, um, um, how do I say, identified to be cleansed. After being separated, we get sanctified, and in that sanctification process, in the dimension, he purifies. Now, when we talk about purification, it is not just one time inside the fire and we come out. No. The Lord actually interestingly purifies us layer by layer. Every time we think we have passed a particular test, the purification is over, and now it's hallelujah, praise the Lord, we can dance around, I have passed the test. No, that is only one layer that has been purified. Then what happens as a refiner, he goes to the next layer. Then he goes to the next layer. 
He goes to the next layer. So the next question, Veronica, when, then, when does this refining and purification process stop? It stops when we see him face to face in his glory. Till then, we are going to go to this refinement. We are going to go to this purification. Till our last breath, he will be as a refiner, refining and purifying us. And why he does it? He wants to purify us, the priests. Now, scripture says we are called as the royal priesthood. Now, meaning to say we are the priests. So as a priest, he is our high priest. Okay, He is our high priest who actually purifies the priest. Now, a priest, you know that before we, he goes into the tabernacle, he needs to have himself cleansed. Right? He needs to cleanse his hands, his feet. His, he has to basically cleanse not, not just his physics, even his, his life within. He needs to clarify. He needs to purify. So simply, when we go to this refining process, this purifying process, what happens is we get ourselves cleansed. We get ourselves purified so that when we go before him, Okay. Before I move on, the scripture, uh, biblical reference for this is taken from Zechariah chapter 13, verse 9a, which says that the Lord, uh, he will bring us through the fire to refine and test. Okay, the, 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 the fiery experience is every time to refine and test. It is not to harm us. It is not to destroy us. It is not to cripple us. It is only to refine and test us only for one reason because he sets us apart for himself. So that is why he allows this refining and this testing. And coming back to the point of why the priests, we the priests need to be purified, we need to be refined, is simply because we, when we bring before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, our offerings as the priests, our hands, our spiritual hands and our physical hands must be cleansed and purified and the offerings that we bring before him must be in righteousness because he is a righteous God. And scripture says that when we call on his name, he will hear and answer. Similarly, in Jeremiah 33 verse 3 it says, call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. But here the key reference is he will hear and answer. Now, it doesn't mean if I hear the phone ringing, I will answer the phone. I can hear the phone, but I do not need to answer. Am I right? Similarly for y'all, when you're busy, you hear me calling, but you did not have to answer. Or nowadays texting. I text or you text me and uh, we will hear the beep of the, the message, but we will not immediately answer because we are busy. We are occupied. We will take time to reply. Right, But here the Lord says that when we bring before him offerings of righteousness, in righteousness, as the priest who has been refined, who have been purified, when we call unto him, he not only hears, but he answers. And remember earlier on, we talked about that the Lord demonstrates authority and ownership. Again, you see here when he says, it is my people. He, he claims us, the priest, as his own by saying this are mine, this people are my people. And he shows the authority there and the ownership is again demonstrated. So as a refiner, when he brings us through this process, he's very clear of the end result. The end result is when you come before me, you come in righteousness so that I will accept your offering and it will be a pleasing aroma to me. And I'll be able to hear and answer you and give you my mandate. And that is why he allows us through the fiery process. So this is the overview for this scripture. We saw him as a refiner, the purifier, as the high priest and the righteous God. So basically this, I just want to bring you to this attention is the silversmith, when he holds a piece of silver, traditionally, uh, not in current days, traditionally in the olden days, he will hold the silver over the fire and he makes sure it's in the middle of the fire. Okay, where the flame is the highest, the strongest and hottest, okay? Meaning to say he too will get the heat. 
okay? But he does not move away from it. He makes sure the silver is there and he makes sure he holds it there. So all the impurities of the silver will go away from it. And what happens is while he is holding the silver upon the fire, okay, all throughout, his attention is always there, just like the potter. Okay, the similarities are there. The characteristics are very similar. The potter always has his attention on the clay. Similarly, the silversmith always has his attention upon the silver. The goldsmith has his attention upon the coal all throughout the process. Because even a moment longer, if the silver is in the fire, the silver will get damaged. Now, many a times when we walk through different struggles in our life, we say, Lord, when will this end? When will I get a break? When is this going to end? But scripture says that the Lord will not allow more than what we can bear. But to us, it's unbearable already. We can't take it. We say, this is, I, I can't tolerate this anymore. Lord. Enough is enough. All of us are guilty at one point or other. I have said it to the Lord in the past by saying, Lord, enough, Lord. Please find another candidate again. Why me again? You know, I've jokingly told him, you know, please find another candidate. Okay. But I know he allows things to happen simply because He's just stretching my faith. He's stretching me. He's just refining me. He's just purifying me. He's, I'm still work in process. I'm work in progress just like a clay would be. And scripture says he will not allow more than what we can bear. Because if he allows more than what we can bear, just like the silver here, a little bit more, a moment longer, the silver will get damaged. And if he allows a bit more than what we can bear, we will get damaged. And he knows exactly what is our capacity, what is our potential, and what is our strength. So he will not test us beyond. That's a definite assurance. And the silver speed knows when the silver is fully refined. So before I go to answer how, I just want to ask anyone, can you just share with me, when and how will the silver smith know that the silver has been refined and purified? Any tries? No right or wrong answer. Andili sees himself in that. Wow, reflection. bravo, bravo. I, I, bravo, very excellent answer. <laughs> okay, very true. Okay, thanks, sister. Very true. When the silversmith sees his own image in the refined soul. Till then, the refining process happens. So remember I told you earlier that till we see him in his glory, the refining process continues. Why I said is day by day, we are advancing to, to be like Jesus. Okay, because we are created in the image of God. We are every day climbing this, uh, this uh, ladder, aspiring or how do I say, we're taking efforts through the work of the porter and the refiner to, to come in alignment to be likened to his image. But the full image, okay, of the silversmith, of the, of the refiner of Lord Jesus will be seen when we go up to see him in person. In this world, we will reach maybe, maybe I would say, maybe I can give 99%, okay, but the 100% is when we are with him. His entire image will be seen in us because we are in his glory. So the refinement process, it continues. So whenever you're going through a uh, squeezing, uh, crushing, burning sensation, just know one thing in your life, that the potter is at work, the refiner is at work. And why? Because he's always working his best in our life. The refiner is always trying us, choosing us, is refining us and purifying us. When I was doing this study, uh, especially this early morning, I woke up at about 4.30. I was trying to prepare myself you know, before the morning session. Uh, I had this question for myself. Does he try me first or does he choose me first? It doesn't it, isn't it logical? He chooses, he tries. Then if I am a good candidate, then he refines and purifies. Doesn't it work that way? You know, I was trying to like, uh, debate within myself. So I said the best person to answer me is the Lord and definitely where do I get it is in the scripture. So I refer to the scripture and Isaiah 48 10 says, I have tried and chosen you in the furnace of affliction. So the answer, that's how this order comes. He tries us first and then he chooses us. It's not that he chooses us and tries. He tries all of us and he chooses and that's when the refinement and the purification happens. So before I end in conclusion, very quickly, 
okay? 10 more minutes. I just want to share with you about this uh, person uh, that I admire and I've come across uh, this uh, in this recent times, you know, um, in this year. Um, one day when I was asleep, I had this dream about, uh, um, for, for people I think who have uh, long been with me, you know, that some of you would know that many a times the Lord speaks to me through dreams. Okay, uh, it, it's scriptures and of course, you know, the spirit of God whispers his words and, and all of this are there. However, dreams are something that I would say that it has, it started years and years ago. Okay, For many, even when I was very much younger in the Lord, it started in dreams. The Lord has revealed many things. And I, even in one of the sharing, I, I mentioned to you about the trip to Portugal. It was through a dream. The Lord directed me. So um, I had this dream about Ireland. And in Ireland, a particular place, I mean, I didn't know it was Ireland, but he, the Lord just showed me a name of place, just like Portugal, okay? Just like Portugal, uh, for Portugal, it was just a country. He didn't show me a specific place. I had to go hunting for it uh, with the assistance of the Lord, of course. But uh, for this, uh, in this dream, it was a particular place. It was just a name of a place. So I had to get up and go and search and search and search. Where is this place in the world? Because I don't know basically where is this place, you know, and the name sounds like so odd. And finally, I, dis I discovered it's actually in Ireland. So I knew that there was some connection uh, the Lord was putting in my heart about Ireland. So I just registered it in my journal and there it was. So after he showed me Ireland, interestingly, he introduced me to this Amy Carmichael. Why do I say introduced? It's like, I don't know anything about her, but suddenly this person who is from Ireland, she's from Ireland, this person's story popped up in my phone. And when I went and checked it out, who is she? She was born in Ireland. So it kind of connected the dots with the Lord prompting me about Ireland and then showing me about Amy Carmichael. And I wanted to share about her life and why I want to share about her life. It's in relation to the potter and the refiner, about the Lord setting us apart for himself. So if you look at uh, Amy's life, okay, you can see that she was born in 1867 in Ireland and she went to be with the Lord in 1951. Okay, and she dies peacefully. So this is an uh, entire chronological order of her life. It looks pretty decent. It looks good. But many a times in our lives, even in our lives, when we look at our life in chronological order, everything looks real good. Chronologically, everything seems fine. Perfect. But actually, the in-between story, only the Lord knows because he's the author of it. And he is the one who's, who journeys with us. Similarly for Amy. Now, just to give you a, a brief uh, intro about Amy's life. Now, she was in Ireland and then she had gone to different countries and uh, she went to India and she found her calling there. And, and uh, she uh, saw there was this uh, David Darcy's, I mean, this uh, girls who will be used as prostitute in the temples. You know, this is, this I'm talking about in, uh, in the 18, hundreds, okay, it's in the 1800s, okay, so this was then uh, in India, not now, not that I know of, okay, so she started to rescue these girls, so be, she became a refuge for these children, and uh, she started to do hospital, nurseries, and also a boys section, and the challenges were very real for her, she was a single woman, she was not married, uh, and uh, she was basically devoted to the work of the Lord, and she was living in, 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 the, in the midst of a, 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 a different culture altogether, a different people, a different language, a different belief system, a, a different traditions and values and, and practices. Everything is different. So she had to adapt to it, and she needed to learn to live by it. And apart from those challenges, money was a very big issue because, you know, when you, you save these children from the temples, uh, she always needs the money for their medicine, you know, when the children get sick and for their food and for their education. So it was ongoing challenge. And she always petitioned to the Lord and the Lord was providing, okay? But in the midst of this all, she was accused as a child catching Missy, okay? Now, she's in a foreign land. She's not in Ireland. She is not of the same um, ethnic group. She's from a different ethnic group altogether. She was positioned, I would say, at a post in India, in the midst of this group of people. 
And what happened was not only was she accused, she had been brought before the court for false claims. Now, why they accused uh, falsely and brought her to court is simply because so that they can get some of these children from her, from a shelter back to the temple. Okay, that was the attempt they made. So if, if I may say, she, as a single woman, she faced a lot of challenges. Okay. So many a times we will say, you know, Lord, you brought me, you asked me to go to this place, you asked me to do this work, you asked me to move on to this aspect, you asked me to take on this uh, opportunity, this job, you asked me to study this, you asked me to be with these children, you asked me to do all this, but when problems come, we say, but Lord, where are you? I mean, I thought I hurt you, where could I have gone wrong? I mean, always we hear that, you know, when the Lord... Um, uh, how do I say it? He, he charters your plans. Uh, everything is peace and, you know, God grants you favor. God grants you uh, the protection. He gives you the money. Uh, actually, it's not true all the time. Okay. Uh, because I would say sometimes, yes, it is true. The Lord provides everything. But many a times I would say no, because scripturally, you see, most of the servants of God in the scripture, they had their own fiery experience. And here, Amy Carmichael had a fiery experience. As a single woman in a foreign land, her defense was only God. God positioned her there, but in the midst of she being positioned there, she had to be accused falsely, and she had to be brought before court. So if I thought this was already the refining process, the story is not over yet, okay? And one afternoon, Okay, the sun was setting and in the evening, she was inspecting, you know, she, they were building a building and she was inspecting and in those days, uh, they will actually dug a hole uh, 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 for the lettering, it's like a lettering pit, and she didn't see it, so what happened, she, she fell into it, she fell and she broke her leg and she dislocated ankle, so ankle, it's not a big deal, right, I mean, you could say that you can still walk, you can still recover, you know, it's not like the entire leg bones are crushed. It's just that part and with some treatment, it, it, it is, I would say, at least you can walk around, you know, because you still have the other leg functioning. That's what the doctors thought too. However, in actual fact, what happened was after taking a few steps around the room, she never walked freely outside again. She became an invalid for 20 years, not for two days, not for two weeks, not for 20 days or 20 days, not for 20 weeks or 20 months, but 24 years. She spent the rest of her life as an invalid in the confined bedroom. Now, during this COVID times, many a times we struggle when we are being confined within our homes and across the world, this happens. But this woman, she became not only an invalid, she was confined not to a home, but to a bedroom for 20 years. Now, I've, I never had the opportunity to, to meet Amy Carmichael to ask her how was her experience in those 20 years. I believe that when I get to heaven and I definitely meet her, I'm going to ask her how was her 20 years experience. You know, I'm sure she will have uh, many stories and I'm sure she could have cried to the Lord. I'm very sure about it. She didn't have anyone, an, an immediate uh, confidant, except for those who are working close to her, very close to her, but I'm meaning like, you know, like a, a partner in her life that she can share a uh, sort of tears, someone help her around. She, had, she, she, besides the help that she got from those working with her, um, she didn't have an immediate soulmate. It was the Lord only. And I'm sure she could have cried her heart to the Lord, Lord, you brought me here and I'm here faithfully positioned where you wanted me to be. And in this 20 years, I've become an invalid. Scripture says in 91, Psalms 91, that the angels watch over us so that our feet do not get hurt against a stone. So what happened at this point? Why didn't the angels be there to guard over our life, to guide her, to protect her? So do we say the scripture became unreal? Definitely no. But this was Amy's refinery. It was her furnace. Now, did can we say that the Lord did not see it? Of course, he always focuses his eyes. The porter and the refiner, they are always giving their fullest attention on whatever they are doing. But yet the Lord allowed, because as the scripture says, he will not allow more than what we cannot bear. And he knew Amy could bear this much. And in it, he gained glory. Because it says, out of the 37 books that Amy wrote in her life, 13 of them, 
were born out of the confined bed during the 20 years as an invalid. And despite the strong years or weak years, the book still live on. And when she was 84 years old, she went to be with the Lord. If I were Amy, I think I would have begged the Lord to please bring me home ASAP. I'll not want to be an invalid. It's too painful being dependent on others. You know, when I went through my major surgery a few years ago, I had to depend on my aunts. You know, just, I think for just a short while, a month or two, uh, in that two months plus, I was depending on them. It was not easy. You know, being so independent in life, you suddenly need to depend on another person. You don't like it. But here, this woman who was uh, chartering new waters to become a refuge to these girls, and he was looking into the education, the needs of these children, you know, who was being an inspiration to the people there, who, who was introducing Christ to this, this community. She became an invalid and she had to depend on others. Her tears would have been plenty, but despite the pain, the suffering, and the tears she experienced, she never gave up on the Lord. She wrote 13 books. So when I looked at her life, and especially because, because she came from Ireland, and because of the connection with Ireland, I knew there was something the Lord was encouraging me in, in, in my life itself. She has gone through more than what any of us, I believe, could have gone through. But she never gave up. She was at the potter's wheel till she died. She went through the refinement, the refining and the purification. She was in the furnace of affliction till she went to be with the Lord, but she pressed on. And there's this, script, this verse or this uh, quote of Amy that is very dear to my heart. It says that she remained faithful. She remained at a post faithfully serving. She never gave up. She was still serving even when she was an invalid. Today, you and I are not an invalid. We are in different times. Yes, we are in situations and um, surrounding that is not what we expect it to be. We can't just leave out and go lead our life in our usual manner now. And we may, we may have had some losses along our journey in life. We could have lost precious ones, we could have lost valuable possessions, and we would have even gone through experiences that we can't even share to another because that much of pain would have gone through. But looking at Amy Carmichael, just want to encourage that she remained at a post faithfully serving, even as an invalid. So despite whatever that you are going through, remain faithful at your post, fulfilling what you are being set apart for. When the Lord sets you apart, it is not always going to be a rosy garden. It is not always going to be hallelujah, praise the Lord. There is going to be pain. There is going to be tears. There's going to be frustration you're going to experience at times. And there's going to be bountiful loneliness. There are going to be moments when you're not being understood. You're going to be misunderstood. Where you can be even be wrongly accused. But as long as you remain faithful serving him, he gets the full honor and glory. So in summary, when we say the Lord sets apart, when you are being broken and molded by the pot, when you're being refined and purified by the refiner, just know one thing, be assured of one thing, that you are being broken, you're being molded, you're being refined and you're being purified to be his, for his use, simply because you are being set apart by him and for him. God bless you.